please. All right. All right, great. Well, thank you very much for joining us. I hope you've poured yourself your favorite libation and are ready to participate in the sip and saw. Um, just a brief in, bit of information about the Metal Arts Guild of Georgia. The Guild was started in 1998 by a group of friends who had been going to local festivals, engaging in tool swaps, stone swaps, and touring local galleries. They got together and they decided that they might like to pull together resources and tools for their benefit. Uh, and they did that. In May of 2015, it's gotten big enough that these folks decided to go ahead and uh, organize, and they became a 501c3 and called it the Metal Arts Guild of Georgia. Um, a building was leased in Doraville, which is a community just north of Atlanta. It's basically the greater Atlanta metro area. Mm -hmm. And uh, at this point, the MAG Studio in Doraville is one of the largest and best equipped uh, studios in the Southeast for learning the art of metalsmithing and jewelry making. In 2022, shortly after COVID, as we were talking about, we expanded our website, added a robust, robust schedule of classes at all levels, beginner, intermediate, and advanced, and also ramped up our workshop offerings. Um, we offer a live in-person and virtual. Our virtual is really sort of state-of-the-art, except for me. Um, and we have workshops with artists from all over the country. Our classes, workshops, and open studio hours can be found on our website at metalartsguildofgeorgia.org. Um, we hope to see you for our classes. We'd really like to see you at uh, Tom's class. And, and please forgive me, would you like to be referred to as Tom or professor or whatever? It's fine. Yeah, most people call me Tom. Okay, I'll do that. Thank you. So essentially, if you are interested in taking this class, the link is already in the chat. I just go to www.metalartsguildofgeorgia.org. Well, it's, you know, it's a long name. Metalartsguildgeorgia.org slash classes slash perfect box construction. That should get you there. It's longer than that, but that part of it will get you there. All right. Uh, we also encourage you to join MAG if you would like to. Uh, there are advantages to that. There's a discount on workshops and classes. And it also includes a uh, uh, second Saturday, which is a free class that we offer to our membership. It's uh, about two or three hours, you get a little bit of a instruction from an instructor and then you do a project. We also have open studio for $5 an hour in our studio, if you're a member. So consider that if you would. All right, let's see, no, uh, let's see. is there anyone else that needs to be allowed in? Not at this point, okay. So um, to begin with, let me just say that it's a real honor and it's kind of daunting for me to introduce Tom Muir to you. Um, at this point, uh, Tom Muir has been teaching at the Bowling Green State University for 19 years. Uh, he is the distinguished research professor. Um, he's a distinguished research professor at Bowling Green, and he's head of the jewelry and metalsmithing department of the School of Art. He received his uh, Master of Fine Arts from in Indiana University in Bloomington, and his Bachelor of Fine Arts from Georgia State University right here in Atlanta. He has lectured and taught widely, uh, wi not not wildly, but widely. <laughs> wildly, too. Probably wildly as well. <laughs> Holding positions at universities and craft schools around the country. He's past president of the Michigan Silversmiths Guild, was appointed distinguished member of the Society of North American Goldsmiths, and currently serves on the executive committee of the International Jewelry College Association as representative for uh, the Americas. Uh, he's received numerous awards. He's written and published. And, you know, to me, as a kid, I grew up in Richmond, Virginia, and every year included a trip to Washington, D.C. and the Smithsonian Museums. And I recall going to the silver collection, and it was like just so impressed by what they had there. And I, I am so honored to introduce someone that has someone on permanent exhibit, not at one Smithsonian Museum, but two. Mm -hmm. uh, he also has uh, work at the in the White House collection. <laughs> and I mean, that's, that's pretty darn impressive. Um, so... At this point, I'm going to admit one more person, and we're just going to start. And I'm just going to start asking Tom some general questions about how we became a middle smith, what his inspirations were, uh, and then we're going to talk a little bit about what it is that he wants to teach you uh, during this workshop. So, so Tom, uh, you grew up in in Atlanta, is that correct? Yeah, I um, lived the first 26 years of my life in um, Sandy Springs. Okay, where did you go to high school? Sandy Springs High School. All right. So did you take any art classes there? No. But you did take drafting. 
I did. I took some. Um, oh, you know what? I I took. Uh, we had industrial arts. That's what. That's mm -hmm. what I was mostly interested in. So I did a lot of industrial arts classes. How did you decide to go to Georgia State and basically uh, become a metalsmith? Well, um, actually, I could um, go. I have a PowerPoint. I could talk about all that if you'd like. Or sure. Or I could just answer it now and, and we could go through. But um, yeah, I, I signed up at Georgia State not intending to be an art major. And, um, you know, to be honest, I um, I started taking art class. You know, I just didn't know what career opportunities there were. So I never really thought about art as a, as a career choice until I got into school and then started finding out more about it. But um, I was just walking down the hall one day in the art department and saw metalwork in the display case. And and um, it looked really interesting to me. And, you know, I didn't even know you could, um, you know, that they had classes like that in a, at a university. And um, so I just took the first class and um, loved it and, you know, went from there, just kept doing it. And then I found out you could get a degree doing this, which really surprised me. Um, should I admit somebody? Else? Oh, you just. Oh, I, I just did. You just keep on. I'll do the admitting. OK. Um, yeah, if you'd like, I could just start the PowerPoint and um, I've got about 60 slides, but I was going to talk about that, you know, how I got into it and sure, that'd be great. And then how it relates to the workshop, too. So um, let me go ahead. I'll share my screen. I'm going to open this PowerPoint and um, I have to move windows around. Oh, um, I was going to say, too, you know, I've been teaching at Bowling Green State University for more than 19 years. You're making oh, okay. me younger than I am. I've actually been here 33 years, I think. Oh, it wow. Is. I must uh, have pulled an old article. I apologize. Yeah, I, yeah there must have been. It, it would go back a, a little bit. And I was at College for Creative Studies in Detroit for six years also. Okay, uh -huh. so I'm going to share my screen. And let's see, share screen. There it is. So I have a PowerPoint on box making, but I'm going to talk about, can you all see this yes. um, image? Okay. So let me do the slideshow. Okay. Can you all see this? Okay. Yeah. Okay. So um, this is an example of a box yeah. form. It's a, it's an exercise that um, I give to all my beginning students or actually, you know, a lot of times my grad students that come in that um, they have varying levels of experience, but um what we learn in here really is about how to fabricate and um, how to lay things out in, in the order of processes to make the work go efficiently. And um, so usually people, uh, you know, I, I really think of it as a foundations but uh, exercise, but you can, you know, no matter what level you are, you can, you can make it more or less complex based on your experience. So um, you know, a lot of my grad students, I actually have them do this exercise to learn how to fabricate because they inevit inevitably end up um, teaching and, and they need to know how to have these skills. But um, box making is is probably the the um, I'd say the one of the hardest things to do in jewelry and metalwork. And it's not just about boxes in terms of a silversmith box making, you know, um, anything to do with fabrication, this would help people with. And, um, you know, I teach, I've been teaching workshops for many years and, you know, a whole range of people, but I've had people that with 20, 30 years experience that, you know, really don't have great proficiency with filing or, or soldering. So, uh, you know, afterwards, that's what they, they feel like they gain quite a bit from his basic foundations that'll um, open up doors for him in, in a lot of different ways. But um, so I'm going to come back. I'll talk about this piece later. But um, this is a box from a beginning class. And um, I'll show different projects that relate to this. But um, the we usually, I, I'll make a rectangular box and a um, cylindrical box. And we'll have a either a force fit lid on it or we'll hinge it. So you'll learn some basics of hinge making. That's really my most popular workshop is, is the hinge making. But um, anyway, let me just go through some of these and trying to, to advance. Okay, here. Now, this is a piece I made when I was at Georgia State. And it was in my jewelry one class. 
Now I did do three dimensional design in jewelry and these were 10 week uh, quarter system. So Charnel, I was just asking um, what time, what, what year you started at Georgia State. Charnel was in school with me there. And, uh, but I made this piece in 1979. And at the time, you know, really, I, I wouldn't expect any of my beginning students to make a teapot and with a hinge on it or do this kind of forming or construction. And, um, you know, looking back after I did it, I, you know, maybe I wouldn't have made it if I, if I, had that in mind first. So I, I it was just starting and I didn't know that beginning students weren't supposed to, you know, or not yeah. supposed to, but but normally don't make pieces like this. So uh, but what it did teach me, it, it's it's a variation on a on another idea it changed as I was making it. What it did teach me is it it taught me really basic skills on how to form metal, how to construct um you know, multiple parts in a piece, how to register those parts and keep them in place and uh, and make hinges. So when I made this hinge, it's kind of an unusual hinge. I, I carved that out of brass, but um, we had uh, two professors there, Jim Freldenhoven and, and Richard Mafong. And um, I was asking them about hinge making and they told me, well, there's some books you can read on how to make hinges. So I, I read them and then as, you know, I made another piece with a hinge and then another one. So after maybe three of them, I realized that what I was reading in books wasn't very good information. Yeah. And I started asking my professors, I thought, well, what, who are these people writing books? And um, I would, so I started look, I thought, well, I'm going to look at the hinges they've made and I couldn't find any hinges. So what I found out is that a lot of these people writing books never actually did what they they're teaching. It's a lot of things are being passed down and there's a lot of myths that keep getting perpetuated. Anyway, so let's move on. Um, I'm trying to, okay, so I'll just talk about, you know, what my own interests are in metal smithing and, and how I approach it. Um, you know, I was really interested in, um, uh, you know, also if I go back to that teapot, um, the fact that you could take flat sheet metal and then form it into these volumetric form. I mean, I just thought it was an amazing process. Mm -hmm. And also, you know, I would, at the, my thinking at the time, whether, you know, I don't know that I would say this now, but at the time I was thinking metal smithing and jewelry seemed like the most, um, I don't know, uh, it'd be comparable to playing a really difficult musical instrument. And so I thought, well, this is, you know, I, a lot of a lot of the people, they're probably the most enrollment was in painting or sculpture or ceramics. And so I was I wanted to do something a little more unusual. But I my thinking at the time was if I could do metal work, I could do anything else. So um, but, you know, um, here's an example of um, uh, some of the things I'm interested in. I really think about metal working as a or metal as a skin or a shell. And these Airstream trailers are probably a good um, way to look at this. Um, you know, of all the craft disciplines, um, metal smithing, generally speaking, um, you have a much thinner wall than, say, ceramic or not necessarily with glass, but most of the time. Um, and, um, but I was just really fascinated by that, how you could make this really lightweight, but structurally sound form out of sheet metal. So, uh, and, and lightweight too. And, you know, most people probably associate with metal thinking about heavy, um, um, heavy, weighty, really, um, structurally, um, solid pieces, but, you know, not, doesn't have to be. And here I'm trying to go forward and I don't know what's. Let me try. OK, so, you know, also engineering principles of uh, metalworking. Now, um, I don't know if people realize this, but the ridges in cans, um, that's those are put there not for looks, but to to make the piece structurally um, stronger so they mm. don't crush easily. And, uh, you know, Soda cans literally are paper thin, but because of the three dimensional structure of those of those forms, they can hold up. I mean, you could stand on um, aluminum cans, and and they'll hold up again based on the the um, structure. You know, if you just had a flat sheet of aluminum, it would collapse. So um, you can find same principles in nature with these orchids. The um, these are 
you know, literally paper thin, but that three-dimensional structure is what um, keeps them from ripping or falling apart. And, um, and here's an example of a piece I made back, um, back in the 90s, at the end, late 90s. I, this piece, I did, made that in two days. But, um, you know, I was really thinking about a thin skin and then the, also the hammer marks being the, you know, like a fingerprint of the, I was actually going to put my own fingerprint on there, but I thought I'll just let the hammer marks be the, my fingerprint. Okay, so, and here's another principle too. This is a, um, you know, I'm trying to think of the name now, um, a constructivist artist, um, but this is a, um, an example of the, it's called the stereoscopic method. So, you take six planes and create a cube. And the one on the left is probably the most common cube people would think about, but the one on the, the right um, incorporate, so it's, it's volume of space instead of volume of mass, which would be on the right. But the one on the right is also, the, the one on the right is much more interesting visually. And it's also structurally as sound as the one on the left. And I mean, you could find examples of this, in, like an I-beam in, in um, buildings is the same thing. You don't need a solid piece of steel to support the weight that's needed. And, you know, there's other examples I could go through. Um, honeycomb is another example of a structural, of a structure that can be super thin and, but yet very strong. Bird bones, is another thing, another example of that. Okay, so... I'm trying to use my keyboard to move forward. Okay, this is a piece of one of uh, my graduate school professors, Randy Long. And um, so when I was at Georgia State, there was a, if, if I'm remembering correctly, Charnel, you may be able to correct me on this. Georgia State had a gallery, I think at Colony Square. And, and there was an exhibition there that I helped to set up in, I think, 1981. And so one of Randy's pieces, I had not met her yet, but um, she had a piece, it might not be this particular piece, but one very similar to it. And I remember um, Richard Mafong and I were looking at it and we were going, like, how did she inlay these pieces? It's so perfect. And um, we were thinking maybe she used a laser to cut them out and then and inlay those. It's just so perfectly made. And also the, you know, copper is a, fair, a pretty dirty metal and so is nickel silver. So this is um, silver, copper, shakudo and um, nickel silver. And so, you know, nickel silver, because it's so dirty, can create um, pitted solder joints. So same with copper. And so two years later, I, I met Randy she, um, when she interviewed viewed at George at um at Indiana University where I was in grad school and um I told her this about her I said you know we were looking at your piece and we couldn't understand how did you do that we thought you used lasers and she was laughing she goes no I did it all by hand and I thought you know I want to learn how to do this and the other thing too in the in the workshop that you know with the title of it I I say with um without um warpage and without binding wire so um, this is one of the big problems when you're heating and soldering um, large sheets of metal is the warpage that occurs. So um, there's some there's some ways to eliminate that or or not have to deal with it at all. And also, most of the books will tell will instruct you to use binding wire. I almost never use binding wire. There, I probably have used binding wire five times in the last 25 years. And um, it, later in the slideshow, I'll show you an example where I would use it, but most of the time not, especially a rectangular box form, I wouldn't use it. And um, so anyway, I just wanted to learn to make clean solder joints and, and you know, how do you put together a piece like this that's so complex and so many solder joints without the thing falling apart or soldering together? So um, anyway, let's try to move forward. I'm, okay, so here's a, an example of a piece I made back in oh, about 23 years ago. In 2000, I finished this, but um, you know, the this is an integral hinge. Now we're not going to cover that in this particular workshop. I can show you some. I'm, I might be able to, you know, I can talk about how this is done, but it really requires a lot of precise sawing and filing. And so that's the when I talk about hinge making. A hinge like this, I'm just, okay, there's my, can you all see my cursor on the screen? Mm -hmm. 
Okay, so this is a variation on an integral hinge. And um, so it's really the, the sawing and filing are the tricky parts, but the soldering you use a, at a lesser degree. Some of the other hinges that I'll make that I'll show you later, the sawing and filing are lesser elements, but the soldering requires more precision. And another thing I'll mention here, um, you can see the hinge pin sticking out. Now, you know, most of the books I've read talk about hammering that hinge pin. You don't need to do that. And th that was one of the things I figured out early on. It's like, well, why do I need to hammer this hinge pin? Um, and these books will tell you to do it. And, um, you know, so one of the things is the length of the hinge. I just force fit them. And that hinge, you know, in 23 years, that pin has not moved a fraction of a millimeter. You can force fit these. So, you know, at some point, all hinges will have to be repaired. Um, all you have to do is push that out. It's just a very tight fit. And if necessary, you could put a very slight bow in that hinge pin. So anyway, I'll just move on from here. Okay, this is a piece I made. It was the last piece I made when I was in grad school. And the reason I show this cycladic figure, I went to a lecture one day by one of the PhD candidates in art history. I just was taking a break from my work. And I thought, I'll go listen to this lecture. And I, you know, I was so glad that I did because there were three of these cycladic figures in the Indiana University Museum. And I'd been working on this silver piece here on the right, and it started out as a fish body. And after I saw this lecture, I thought, I'm going to change. I figured out a way to have a reference to cycladic figures. And I'd already started putting references to the history of art in my pieces. But um, I made a series of lamps, and I had these slats in them. And so I thought, you know, viewed frontally, it, it references the arms crossing. And then the spout on this piece is a uh, it resembles the the face on the um, this cycladic figure, and so I gave this kind of a uh, I gave it a funny title. I called it cycladic hair. Uh, I'm sorry, cycladic figure with his hair in a roller, and um, I was criticized heavily for you know having a, a serious piece but giving it a funny title, and. Um, but three years later, the curator at the Chicago Art Institute bought this piece and paid me a pretty good bit of money. And while we were negotiating the price, he um, he was telling me, he says, you know, some people take these so seriously. And he said, I just love that title. So I, of course, reported back to the people that thought it was an <laughs> awful title and, and told them. But here, here's another thing I would say, a piece like this. Um, these are nickel silver slats that fit around the piece and they fit into this framework. It's like molding. It's quarter round wire. And so it's probably two millimeters wide and about two millimeters deep. And there's, there's, let's see, there's two, there's two, four, six, eight. Um, each section of these has eight solder joints on it and they're really fine wires. So when I went to solder this, I, I really had to think about it. And this is another thing I like is how do you strategize in metalworking? And um, I thought, okay, how am I going to solder these really like wires onto, you know, fine wires um, onto this large piece? But, and so the, here's the danger I faced. Um, the first danger would be just melting them. And the second danger would be the solder joints would come unsoldered because I I did solder the wires together and then fit them on the piece and I had to hold them in place. So um, and then the third danger would be I could solder it on but they would warp. And the fourth danger would be that they'd move out of position. So I had to deal with all those things. Anyway, I went to um, solder this. I you know I set it up and. Um, soldered it and it worked perfectly the first time, which I was really surprised. Now I'm a real stubborn person. And um, I always tell people, you know, if I've done anything worthwhile in my life, it's just, I refuse to give up. So I was prepared to just keep at this until I got it to work, but it did work the first time. I have a funny story to go with this, but I'll, I'll wait till later. I have funny stories with all these pieces, but I'll, I'll save it. Um, but anyway, again, this is kind of thing like, you know, how do you solder pieces of such varying sizes together? And, and so that's another thing we'll, we'll talk about too. All right, I have to click here to get it to progress. All right, here's another piece. This is probably the most complex um, um, 
in terms of fabrication and engineering, it's a it's called Twin Risers Teapot. So I made this in 2006 and seven. And this is the first piece I used digital technology on. So um, for the spout, I was going to form that. And the handle, I ordered an eight pointed star draw plate from Italy. I'm still waiting for it. So I always have plan A, B, C, and D, whatever, all the way down the alphabet I need to go. But I ended up digitally modeling the spout and the handle and um, getting wax prints and then casting them. Mm -hmm. So um, the other thing this piece has is an, is an integral hinge, but it's built on a compound curve. So that made it 10 times more difficult than doing it on a flat surface. And the other thing too, um, <clears throat> you know, my former professor told me when I started this piece, it was going to be in a show that was curated um, at, at Indiana University, an alumni show. And um, she said, please don't use 18 gauge on this, you know, make it out of eight inch thick silver so you don't have to worry about warpage. And I thought, no, no, I'm going to, I can make this out of 18 gauge. And, and I did it and I'm, I can talk about how, how did I do that without warping? And then, you know, the solder joints, I haven't counted these up. It, a lot of these pieces have 60 to 85 solder joints on them. But um, anyway, I can come back to this. I have some, I, I actually photographed the entire making of this and uh, we can talk about some of those here if I have time. So I'll talk also about some useful tools. Um, some of them are tools that will really help you and other ones are maybe alternatives to expensive tools that you might not need to have them. But um, this, this um, miter jig, helps you to get very flat surfaces for hinges or solder joints, but there's alternatives to using that. So I think they're well worth the money, but that there are other ways to do it. So um, here's, here's what I normally do with this. This is, um, you know, the, what I would give my students. Um, we'll use either 16 or 18 gauge um, new gold or brass, but no copper because it's so soft and it and it you'll it's almost like chewing gum, like a stick of chewing gum. That's how soft it is when you've soldered it. But um, I, you know, I don't normally recommend nickel silver, but depending on the person's experience, they could do that. But these are the patterns that um, you know I go through the whole processes of laying them out, how to overlap or where to overlap, and placement of solder so it all goes. Um, smoothly and perfectly. But um, here's another thing too, is um, I use gravers for making stitches that will help um, hold pieces in place. Charnel, you probably use these a lot too. And this is something a lot of the um, participants in the workshop are interested in. I um, well, Actually, the first time I taught this, uh, this workshop for Metalworks, uh, a third of the people in the class really wanted to find out more about the um, gravers and how to use them because, you know, when you go to solder pieces, you don't want pieces moving out of position. Mm -hmm. And um, this is where you won't need binding wire using this. And so I use stitches to hold teapot spouts um, on the form. And I, I actually, that first teapot that I ever made, I used stitches on that. And, uh, you know, again, all the books will tell you to hold it on with binding wire. Well, the problem with binding wire is it warps and moves. And some if you do it too tight, it can actually dent your piece. So I, I've never really liked binding wire for its intended purpose. But I, I can talk more about stitches. It's just a tiny sliver of metal and it holds the pieces in place. And here's what I do. Um, you know, I have the starting point uh, about one millimeter from a scribe line. And then as you push it in, um, the tip of the graver goes in, and then this is the, if that makes sense, you'll see some images of this. That's what the side cross section would look like. And then, um, so, you know, for cylindrical or rectangular boxes, we can put stitches on the base plate or the top plate, or, you know, if you're doing bezels, this is great for bezels too, to hold bezels where you want them, um, using these stitches. So when you start to heat them, they don't pick up and start floating away from the where you want them. And there, and so it looks like this, you, you know, if it's a cylindrical box or a rectangular, or if it's a bezel, whatever you're trying to hold in place, piece of tubing, these stitches will hold it, you know, right where you want it. Same thing with a dome, you know, a lot of times people solder domes down and they'll, they'll lift up and float away. And that's, you know, stitches will, will cure that. 
Okay, so um, the other thing too, you know, I'll show different methods to keep everything square. And, um, you know, I, I would say also, I'm, I'm going to be very particular about how um, the demos go, but, you know, you can do this as precise or imprecise, you know, once you learn how to do it, at least, you might not need the level of precision that I'm going to show, but if you do want it, it's there for you. And, you know, I always tell people our, our degree of accuracy is a tenth of a millimeter. And you might find you're even greater, you know, maybe it's um, you're at a hundredth of a millimeter, possibly. Okay, I'll also, I have a lot of favorite tools. So for box construction, fabricating, this dandelion puller is one of my favorite tools. And, you know, I'll, I talk about that in the workshop too. Um, so here's some, I'll just show you some box forms that students have made. This was a, um, this was a non-art major. It was from the first class I ever taught when I was in grad school. This was a business major came over and he, he came over to talk to me about the class before he registered. And I showed him, you know, some of the projects, some of the things he would expect. And, and I told him, I said, you know, this is going to be a lot of work. And I didn't know if he would want to continue on. And after I explained it to him, he was, you could see his eyes lit up. He was really excited. He says, no, I, I want to be in the class, but this is a piece he made. And, um, you know, I wouldn't expect a business major to make something really artistic, but, you know, I thought he did quite a good job. This is a cylindrical box with married metal. And, um, you know, he had to have really accurate sawing and filing and soldering skills to make this. This is um, new gold and copper and nickel silver. Mm. It has a, has a force fit lid on it. Okay. Oh, I've shown it twice. Here's here's a piece. Now you're going to see a lot of tea infusers. That's one of my research interests. And you know, I don't assign tea infusers. Maybe I did one class, but um, this was a tea infuser. I do show them as examples of fabrication. So this was a student who made a guitar tea infuser with a hinge on it. But this is an example of box making right here. And he made a stand on it. He this was in an exhibition I curated. I've curated three shows on these. And I've got another one coming. I might do a book on them too. Hmm. All right. But, you know, so we'll talk about pattern layout and model making. This is the models he made. And I thought he did such a good job. It helps him to plan out and, and execute the piece much more um, quickly and efficiently. Okay. So another thing I'll show, you know, how to set up pieces to, um, now I usually build these open face kilns. And, um, you know, it's funny, I, I like to watch a lot of YouTube videos and um, I see people soldering just on a, on fire bricks or charcoal blocks or um, pea pumice. And so when you do that, a lot of your heat gets away. So this open face kilns, uh, you know, I go into quite, quite a bit of detail on these um, to trap the heat and hold the heat in, you can bring your piece up to soldering temperature much more quickly. And because you're doing that, you're gonna, your solder, I'm sorry, your flux won't burn out as fast and you'll get much cleaner solder joints. And mm -hmm. also the other thing that will happen, building these bricks around it will cut down on your warpage because it more evenly heats the whole piece. So um, also, you know, on the joints, notice I have no binding wire here. This is liquid paper I'm using on the previously soldered joints. And you can use yellow ochre. You mm. can use, um, I mix up um, kaolin sometimes, which is kill wash. That work, and actually I think kaolin is the main ingredient or one of the main ingredients in um, liquid paper. You know, they use it in paper making, but it's also an ingredient in kaopectate. And uh, kaopectate can work too. It's just very thin. But anyway, so this is the flux solder, you know, and, and of course the solder goes on the outside because it's going to get trimmed off later. And um, anyway, but I talk about the heating, you know, to bring this up to temperature and, you know, hold it to temperature and then zeroing in on the solder joint so you can be um, more, again, more precise with your heating. Here's a cylindrical box. Now, you know, people would say, put binding wire around this cylinder. Now, you know, it would be safe to do that, but I just did it to show that you don't need, um, you don't need to have binding wire. And here's an alternative setup for um, soldering a base on a cylinder or a rectangle for that matter, just lifting it up and then we ricochet the heat underneath to heat the base, it's similar to what happens with a fire screen. 
but you know, I'm going to have a lot of alternative methods of heating. So I use indirect heating a lot. And so I'll bounce the flames off, you know, one brick on to, to heat another part of the piece. The other thing I did is when I, so the, the cylinder, here's the joint on the cylinder. And then, and this is all done with hard solder, by the way, it's not, you know, the joint here is not medium or not uh, hard solder. And then this medium, but you know, if you're a beginner, maybe you would do that. Um, but these, both of these joints were hard solder. And so what I was able to do with, um, to, to heat the solder to get that to flow all the way around, I can ricochet the heat off the deck. So I don't have to reach my torch around the back of it. I can just um, really heat mostly from the front and ricochet. And when the solder starts to flow, ricochet the heat off the back and it pulls it around. Anyway, that was a very clean solder joint. And um, here, got to go forward again. All right, here's another thing, pattern making. This is a real good um, template maker, this site here. So I'll share some of these resources with you too. Um, here's another beginning student. Now, now this is oh, wow. uh, typical of most beginners, but he, he, he made a, you know, it's a hinged piece. And, um, you know, I'll tell you when I was in grad school, my classmate, I think all of my classmates were afraid to make hinges because, you know, and, and pieces that they would want hinges on, but they just didn't want to mess with them because they were afraid of, you know, solder the whole piece together. But you just have to get over that fear. And, um, you know, and this is, I, I gave my student instruction and told him, you know, not what you would read in books, because uh, I have much better information. I, you know, not, not to brag, it's just, you know, the truth. And um, really, I, I found there's there's a couple of books that are pretty good, but I'd say, you know, there's ways to tweak them. I, I do have a book reading list that I share with people, and I'll tell you what are good things and some that are, you know, it's not that they won't work. It's just not the best way to go about it. But anyway, this is a hinged bracelet. It's, a, it's an atom. And, you know, with it's nickel, silver, copper, and that's a brass hinge on the piece. You know, the other thing I find... Um, I see, you know, with a lot of work I see published in books, even the hinges are not engineered very well. So, you know, like on a three knuckled hinge, that middle knuckle should be wider than the than the total of the two outside hinges to make it structurally more sound. A lot of people make these three knuckled hinges, all the knuckles are the same length. That's going to end up with a weak hinge and that middle mm -hmm. knuckle is what's likely to break. And, um, you know, I always show like this laptop computer I have has got a three knuckled hinge on it. If any of you are in a laptop computer, look at that hinge on it. That middle knuckle, that middle joint is much, much wider than the com combined total of the outer two hinges. Um, my flex shaft is hanging up here. Um, the hanging device on that's essentially a three knuckled hinge. The, the flex shaft motor would be the middle knuckle. And then the hanging, that bar on it is you know, X is the two outside hinges. Um, flip phones, same thing you'll find. Um, there are lots of examples. Seems like everybody understands this except jewelers and metalsmiths. Some of them do, but a lot of them don't. Um, here's another piece. This was a beginning student. Now this wow. person, um, she she turned 50 the year she made this and she had a career. She had actually had grown kids when she started in the program, but she had a 10 year career in ceramics. So it wasn't like she was a beginning person, but she'd never fabricated metal. And <clears throat> she made this biological time clock, which is a pretty complex piece. And um, it was funny because as I was showing her that, you know, like I talked to her about how do you fabricate the base and the top of this, this is all hollow, both of the, the whole thing is hollow, really. And I would explain it to her. And then she would look at like, she didn't quite know how this was going to work. And she'd go, are you sure? And I would always say, let me go ask somebody who knows what they're talking about. And so, you know, we'd laugh about it. And then after it took about a year and a half, she kept taking more classes. And um, she, you know, we laugh about that too, about, you know, am I sure? Let me, let me uh, check, double check and, you know, see, see if we can find out. But yeah, we laugh about that now. Okay, here's another student. Now this was a, um, this, this, okay, this may have been a second semester student, or uh, but I think it was actually the third project in the beginning classes. So she made a three finger ring, and it was a sewing kit. 
And same, it is an oval box, but it's, you know, it's the same thing. We, we make a cylinder, cylindrical box and a rectangular box. You know, it's just a combination of those two things. Okay, here's another box form. This is a tea caddy and an infuser. Now, this was a uh, um, this was an advanced student who made this, and this is nickel silver and sterling silver, and then the tea infuser. She made this integral hinge. This this was a pretty tricky one to do, and you know that's not what we're going to do in the workshop. I I can talk about it, but um, we'll see how much time we have. Um, I'm you know I'm happy to share it with you, time permitting. Um, here's the box form, a jewelry. Uh, one student made uh, three, gosh, I hate to think how many years ago, probably I'm thinking three years ago, but maybe it was five. Here's another one. Um, this person, gosh, this goes back almost 20 years. Um, her daughter was one of my students and then she graduated and her mother came in and both of them were outstanding metalsmiths. The daughter uh, works at for Tiffany's. She's been working for them for a number of years, but um Every time I would give a demo, Jackie would just like, she was an overachiever. So she ended up making, you know, she wanted to set a stone in it. So she made a bezel, she uh, made an integral hinge and then made this fabricated box. So that, that was pretty good for, you know, her first class. Um, here's another piece. Now these are hexagonal boxes and I'll talk about this too. Now on these, we normally miter them. So, you know, that's another way to fabricate that's very valuable to, to know how to do. This was, a, um, this was in um, an article I wrote for, um, for Art Jewelry. I think that's the name of the magazine on uh, integral hinges. But I told my students, I said, you know, I'm going to be writing this article. If you want a piece in, in, the, um, in the article, you know, make a piece. And, and she ended up getting it in there. But um, it's, it's honeybees. And so there's text stamped in about, about honeybees and, you know, it's a, kind of an environmental piece, but, uh, you know, she, and of course made it in the shape of a hexagon. Okay. Here's another cylindrical, uh, I'm sorry. Um, what hexagonal box, maybe it's not a hexagon. I have to count the facets, but this was a beginning student too. And I'll show you some setups we did on this one. Um, here, this is Jackie Chrisman again, who did that um, box you just saw with the agate bezel set. So this is a tea infuser she made. Th this won the Saul Bell Award one year. And um, so this is, a, she was, she learned how to do wire weaving. And um, so that lets the boiling water get in when you steep the tea, but um, it also has a bayonet catch on it. And um, anyway, we have this in a collection. We, somebody gave us a lot of money. We could buy work from our graduates and visiting artists. So here's what we do with the, um, you know, scoring. Now, the scoring tool, here's another thing I see, um, and I've seen in books, and normally people make file um, scoring tools out of the tang of the file. It's actually better to use the other end of the file, and, and I'll talk about that too uh, when I have more time for um, greater explanation, but we, we use, this is a digital rendering that I did, but um, I'll show you some of the actual setup for this. And um, so we do mitering. You could do this on rectangular box too. And here's the layout. Too. So I use a back saw and then here's some of the five, these are the files I used. I used half round files. So here's a large one and here's a smaller one with a handle on it. But yeah, most of the books will say use the tang of that file. You know, I think they're a lot harder to sharpen because you don't have as much surface area. And these are, you know, not too hard to make. They're, they're you know, they're doable. And the, I'll tell you, I tested this out when I made my first one. I went up to the door on my office that's a steel frame on it. And I, you know, tested it on the steel. A big curl of steel came off. So <laughs> did a great job. <laughs> here and here's the setup for that to solder it now this is this is a time i would use binding wire you know i could do it without it but um this is a good one to use binding wire and um you'll notice the piece is coated with a fine powder that's boric acid that'll keep your piece very clean i didn't find out about it till i was in grad school but use boric acid mixed with alcohol and it's an oxide preventative or oxide uh, preventer different from flux, which flux will remove oxides, but flux will burn up like a fuel, the boric acid won't, but you get much cleaner joints your, and your flux doesn't have to work as hard. Anyway, okay, now we looked at this piece already. 
and we saw this piece. Now, I think I have some process shots of this. So here's the setup I use. So again, here's an open face kiln. If I didn't have this open face kiln, I wouldn't be able to bring this piece up to temperature and get clean solder joints. So I had a student helping me. You know, uh, this is one of the big questions I get. A lot of my workshops, people say, I want to learn how to solder large scale pieces. And, you know, once they learn these setups, they're, you know, it's like, okay, that was worth the cost of admission right there. And, um, you know, so um, let's see, I lost track of what I was going to say. The, um, I had a student helping me holding this annealing torch. He was up above me and I was down below. And uh, here he is, Andrew Kubek, if any of you know him, he, he's had, he's been in a lot of exhibitions, but he was up above keeping the whole thing hot. And then I was zeroing in using a Presto light torch to, on the solder joints. And I was moving it around. Those are stainless steel tongs that I made. And I move the piece around, it's like, you know, cooking on a grill almost. You can, you know, whatever you're cooking, you can turn it over or move it around to where the heat is. Okay, and then here's another specialized tool. I made this out of a file, it took me about 20 minutes. And, um, you know, I forged it out and then polished it. The, with the polishing, it took me a little more than 20 minutes. But, you know, um, if you do get warpage, you can flatten, you know, how do you flatten that? without marring your piece up. So I have a whole seg segment on it. Here's the setup for putting the spout on. Now I put mm -hmm. stitches yeah. around this. So I didn't use any binding wire whatsoever to hold the spout on. I, I can't believe some of the things I read in books now. And you know, when I taught this workshop, I taught it on Zoom, oh, I don't know, three or four months ago. And the, somebody in the class kept saying, oh, but I read in this silversmithing book to use binding wire. And I said, well, no, we're not using binding wire. That's what the name of the workshop is, no binding wire. And uh, okay, so here's the stitches for the base. Now on this one, I put stitches inside and outside because if those walls of the piece, when I put the bottom on, if those walls warped, you know, I was gonna have to take the bottom off and do it again. And it, it is 18 gauge metal. So um, there's the instruction on the stitch, but here's the setup for it. And I did this on a fire screen. And, you know, of course the solder goes on the outside because you're going to trim that off anyway. And now after I soldered it, I checked it with my straight edge, not, not a lick of warpage on that piece. Amazing. Now here's a tea infuser. Oh, you know, uh, Nell, you, you were asking me about um, some of the, pieces that I sent that people might be intimidated by the complexity. So, you know, it's not that you would have to do a piece anywhere near this complex. It's really about learning the foundations. And then, you know, you would do something according to your own aesthetic. But, you know, again, these problems that we have are, you know, um, how to keep the warpage or eliminate the warpage, how to fabricate complex, complex pieces without, you know, it's again, just gaining precision with your filing, your soldering, and your um, sawing, filing, and soldering. Yeah. And I'll talk about finishing too, because a lot of the finishing techniques that people use are not, um, not the best. So they end up with surfaces that don't look the way they're supposed to. So this has a um, um, locking mechanism on it. Here's another tea infuser I made for, uh, I was asked to curate a show for a gallery. They wanted me to make a piece. And um, oops, here my, I'm spilling gold dust on the floor that I, I made an 18 karat gold piece. I'm spilling the dust on the floor. <laughs> anyway, this is a, um, you know, there's two main types of tea infusers. There's a stick type infuser and there's a ball and chain type infuser. So, you know, ball and chain variety would be a tea bag would be an example of that, only it's made of paper and string. Um, but, you know, you can find in antique stores, actually, you can find stainless steel balls that, um, but they're not very aesthetically pleasing. And um, so that first example I showed, the one just came before this would be the ball and chain variety. Now, this would be a stick type infuser. So like covered spoons, you can see a lot of those, um, you know, you can buy them online or in specialty stores. But this is a piece I, I wanted to make a you know, after that ball and chain variety, then I'm the second year I made a um, um, stick type infuser. So this has a double offset hinge on it. And this, this was a repose technique I kind of discovered. I used to tease people when they'd ask me how I did. I said, well, I shot it with a BB gun. And <laughs> some people believe me, they didn't know I was a jokester that, you know, I'm 
um, have a what I always play practical jokes on people, but um, this is a piece that's in the in the Smithsonian and uh, or it started it was in the Renwick Gallery actually, and here's the open um, this so this also has an offset catch on it. The tension of this rod telescoping in the tubing holds it you know holds it open and hold, and closes it and keeps it closed, but. Um, you know, again, this is another example of the engineering principles I'm interested in. It's not just the forming of the metal, but it's also, you know, like uh, the how do you construct the piece? You have mm -hmm. to think about engineering and things like pin catches and hinges. Those are all engineering devices. So, so, so Tom, could, could yeah. I ask you a question about this yeah, particular piece? Sure. How long yeah. did it take you to make that? That piece probably, you know, I was teaching when I did it. I was teaching full time. I made that in 1992, I think. I think it made me, uh, you know, I was, so I was teaching and doing other things. Um, and I usually work on several pieces at a time. I made it over made a course of about um, two and a half months. That's fascinating. But, you know, if I were to go and just make the piece, I probably could have done it in a week. Wow. That's uh, really cool. Uh, could, could, you know, I don't have, I, I was, was going to bring my phone in. What, how am I doing on time? Well, actually, we've got five minutes left. Oh. So would you like to open it up now to questions from the participants that are here? Uh, yeah, actually, I'm almost at the end here. Um, this, okay. is, this is another tea infuser I made about 20 years ago. This is a silver one, but it's got an integral hinge. And these rings swivel around the fingers. So, you know, how do you solder the rings closed without them soldering to the fingers? So that's something we do, you know, in this mm -hmm. workshop. And then this the the thumb turns a quarter turn clockwise and then the door is spring loaded and it pops open so here's a 18 karat gold one that i made um this was actually the first one and um that was in the art of gold an exhibition that traveled around and um anyway that's the end of my slideshow and let me stop my share now um why don't i take questions oh i see a lot more people have joined um, I do have a brief video. It's six and a half minutes, um, kind of an overview of box making, but I think it'd probably be better if, we, if I answered questions for people. Okay. If, if anybody has any questions, please go ahead and unmute yourself, uh, you know, in, introduce yourself and let's uh, get some questions going. Don't be bashful. <laughs> no questions. I guess you're going to be bashful. Well, would you like to show us your little video? Sure. Before we I do have, that, I have one question. Okay. Yeah, sure. Yep. Um, are you finding um, <laughs> any resistance <laughs> uh, with students <laughs> on online or <laughs> with this particular um, generation? I have uh, students that, that are having problems with uh, getting off their phones and things like that. I don't know if you all have any kind of issues with uh, people not doing uh, as much manual work and being a little bit more uh, handicapped as far as, as Using their uh, using their there hands. Was some kind of a, there was some kind of a reverberation. Yeah, there was some kind of weird thing going on. Yes. Yeah. Yeah, so oh, Charnel, if I understood, you're saying that people being distracted by their phones, or is that? Yeah, people who are who are not um, manually educated anymore. <laughs> they have an issue. Oh, I mean, I don't. Is it, are you having any problems with uh, students who who are not? Um, as manually skilled? I do, you know, um, but the, the funny thing is a lot of people um, actually take the jewelry class because they're so tired of working on a computer all day. Uh. <laughs> they want to work with their hands, but yeah, it's, it's, you know, I think really with phones, I had to outlaw them from the studio at one point because they were all texting, like even during critiques, they'd be texting. It's like, what are you doing texting during a critique? Mm -hmm. and wow. So I just outlawed them completely. And, um, you know, I've, I've been able to release that now, but, you know, I had a faculty member's daughter not too long ago, about four years ago, and I was teaching her how to saw. And she was in this class. I do a summer ring making class. So she okay, so she had her saw, if y'all can see this. Um, and she's sawing and she, you know, I'm walking around helping students and I and she's going, I'm struggling, I'm struggling. 
And I went over and I look over, you know what? She had her phone set up on her bench with a video going and she's sawing like this. If you can see me, she's going like this, watching a video, trying to saw. And I said, you have to look at your work. Now, can you imagine her dad was a painter or is a painter? And I said, can you imagine your dad trying to paint? And he's looking at a phone, well, you know, like don't look at the canvas, just look at your video and then try to paint blindly over here. <laughs> But Charnel, I would say really the biggest um, issue now, like coming back from COVID, I, a lot of the students started, they just want to watch these instructional videos that we have. And mm -hmm. that's not really enough. And so a lot of times right. they don't come and ask questions. It's not just me, you know, I've asked colleagues all over the country and they're saying, yeah, you know, it's like the, the, they almost yeah. broken of, of, you know, working in class and asking questions and interacting with people. Okay, so we got an hour, and I think this thing's going to turn off on us in about a minute. So I would first of all like to say, Tom, thank you so much. This has been a wonderful, wonderful uh, session for us. And uh, for all of you that are not already in this class that's coming up, coming up next month, the uh, link to it is in my chat. You can go to metalartsguildgeorgia.org slash classes. Going to see all the classes that we have and then please sign up we'd love to have you on the class for for tom um and uh basically we're about out of time we've got some comments uh your work is amazing it was a great talk once again thank you so very much i wish we had scheduled two hours for this yeah um, well you know i'm happy to answer questions people want to email me you're welcome to email me should i type in my email sure address? that'd be great it's just T Muir at BGSU for Bowling Green State University edu. So there's I just typed it in, but okay. uh, yeah, I'm happy to answer questions and and uh, but I, you know thanks to everybody for joining and um, yeah, Charnel, it's great to see you after all Good these see years. You too. <laughs> Can you believe how many years have gone by? It just seems like it just flew by. I know. <laughs> we were young, young what in our twenties. Yep. <laughs> wow, well, no, I don't know about you. <laughs> no white hair at all on me. <laughs> well, once again, thank you so very much. And come join us in Tom's class. I'll be thank there. Thank you. Oh, all you'll right. be there, Charnel? Uh, yes, see, I'll I, be there. <laughs> I get a lot of pros in my class because Charnel's an excellent fabricator. I, I saw your MFA show when I was in, in, in Atlanta when you had Oh, gee. <laughs> well, that's great. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you all. Let this work. Okay. Good night. Thank you. Thank night, you. Everybody. See you later. <laughs>